It was an afternoon like any other, and I marched my 17-year-old self into the cafeteria to talk to the handful of summer camp directors who were there for a few days to interview potential camp staff for the coming summer. And I was determined to convince one of those directors to hire me at 17 and to hire my older brother sight unseen because he was off being a student missionary. I talked to a couple of directors and I quickly got discouraged. Many of them didn't even consider uh, anyone under the age of 18 and others laughed at me when I said, well, what about my brother who's in Australia? And uh, I was discouraged, but I figured before I gave up, I would talk to as many directors as would let me talk to them. And so I sat down at a table with a director of a camp I had never heard of. And because of that 15-minute conversation, I spent the next four summers working at Sunset Lake Youth Camp. Sitting down at that table was a very small thing. But it became a turning point in my life. It didn't just give me four summers of employment and some money for tuition. It brought me into contact with people who I still, till this day, call my very best friends, including Bryson Weir, who I am very glad to have gotten to know. History is full of turning points. Sharon and Jim shared stories of pivotal memories in our history, in our collective American story. And many of us have similar stories of one of those events, of 9-11, 20 years ago when we learned about the Twin Towers. And with a little prompting, we can call to mind not of only other big historical moments, but the small moments like sitting down and having a conversation with a camp director. And looking back with hindsight, these moments, big and small, were turning points with big implications for our lives. Another turning point for me personally was a conversation with a Walla Walla University professor who encouraged me to take more math classes which was not something I thought was a good idea at the time. And uh, because of that conversation, I eventually ended up as a math major as well as a theology major. And that was a very hard but good thing for me. And if your eyes glazed over the second I said math, don't worry, I'm with you, I don't blame you. But my point isn't the math. My point is that anything we learn in life, even math, can help us understand God more, can help us see more clearly his working in our life. A turning point is a term that we have probably heard before, but it actually has a technical mathematical definition. So I'm going to submit you to some math this morning, if that's okay. This is the definition. A turning point is a point on the graph where the graph changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. And there's a little chart there for those of you who are visual learners like myself. Uh, your turning points, you can tell where it is because there's a distinct change, right? Something is not the same as it was before. Your line starts to go in a different direction. And our lives have many turning points. Conversations, baptisms, meeting people, weddings, turning points. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul tells us about a turning point in history. One singular, unique moment where history started to go in a very different direction. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm in the English Standard Version. 
1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. This is the gospel as spelled out by Paul. You are saved because you believed that Jesus died for your sins that he was buried and resurrected. Paul goes on in this wonderful chapter to remind his readers of all the people who Jesus saw and met with after the resurrection. And he closes with this, verse 8. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Paul is talking about the biggest turning point in his own life. That moment where Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus road. Paul was headed to arrest people to persecute the church of God and Jesus meets him. Paul was true in his conviction. He was convicted that he was doing what was right, that he was doing God's work. And Jesus appears to Paul and knocks him off his footing. He confronts him and tells him that he is wrong, that he is working against God's will. And that moment must be burned deeply into Paul's memory. Psychology tells us that moments which are highly charged with emotion can become what they call flashbulb memories. These memories feel highly vivid and detailed, and we recall them in much stronger and detailed ways than other normal memories. Some events like Paul's encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, are crystallized into these kinds of flashbulb moments. With modern communication, some of these moments live on not in just one person, but in cultural recall. We can compare stories. We can tell the, the when, the where, the how of big news events. They're burned into our collective memory. And our recent memory is full of these potential flashbulb moments. As Jim and Sharon shared with us, the first man on the moon, the Oklahoma City bombing, the Vietnam War, Columbine, the Challenger accident, Kennedy's assassination, Princess Diana's death, 9-11. It doesn't take much to remember those moments. And as I look at that list, I am struck by the fact that most of them are moments full of fear and tragedy. But I know that the moments in that list that I remember also brought with them hope. In the wake of these terrible tragedies and disasters, people came together as never before, and they hoped for a better tomorrow. There was an outpouring of community and love and togetherness. And Paul tells us that there is always hope for a better tomorrow. Paul continues in the chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, to lay out the reasons why we can have hope in Jesus. We're not going to read the full chapter today, but I encourage you to pick up your Bibles and read through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is challenging 
and wonderful. And it reaffirms our belief in Jesus. Paul continues in verse 24, he tells us about the moment when Christ will set the world right and death and sin will be destroyed. And he goes on in 35, verses 35 and following to tell us that we don't need to understand all the details of how it happened. What's important, what his main point is, is that Jesus overcomes, and we can trust and hope in that. And then Paul ends this section with verses 51 and following. This is what he says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? This is what is coming. Amen? Even in the midst of tragedies, of these horrible flashbulb memories that live on in collective consciousness, we can hope. In the midst of the sorrow and pain and shock of 9-11 20 years ago, or in the confusion of the COVID crazy that is today, we can hope because of what Christ has done, what he is doing and what he will do. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The turning point is past. The victory is sure. Jesus' death is the ultimate turning point of history. The moment where the graph of history changes from a downward trajectory to upward movement. The cross is the turning point at which Jesus reclaims his creation. The world, you, me. He reclaims all of it from the sinful influences. And the trajectory is always upward. And we can hope in that because Jesus has won. Today, as we recall that moment 20 years ago, which left its mark on history and culture and all of our lives, I hope that we will keep that in mind. The fact that we can hope because of what Jesus has done. And we can hope because the trajectory of the turning point is upward. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you for being a God who cares about us. Who cares about the moments of pain and anguish and joy and hope in our lives. We praise you for being a God who condescended to enter our world as both holy, fully human and fully God and to die on a cross and be resurrected for us. We praise you for being the turning point of history and we place our hope in you. Amen.